New Hope Baptist Church. Sure, glad to see you and uh, have some folks that have been out for a while. This sickness and some other folks have got it now, and they're not here today. Several families decided that Florida was the better place to be, and uh, they're in Florida. It's pretty hard to pray for those that are down there in the hot sun, beautiful weather. And uh, you know, and I, and I have been praying for them until they start sending me good pictures of how warm and and how nice it is and temperatures. I'm like, yeah, forget it. You don't need prayer at this time. But no, several families are out of town. Some had to go visiting uh, ailing family members, and uh, good to see Brother Potter and Mrs. Potter with us uh, today. So glad to have you out of the hospital and here, not ready to run a marathon nor do any gardening, but he is definitely here. Good to see you here, and, and of course, Mitch, Angie, and the kids, so good to see you. I have certainly missed you, and uh, thankfully, you're feeling better, and have visitors with us, Philip uh, Joseph, and uh, glad to have you here today. He is, of course, uh, uh, you know, with politics and stuff, there's a lot of bad politicians, but there's some good ones, and we need some conservative, uh, godly men, women. Uh, helping in the in the political scene, and so uh, he is running for District Four for state representative for Forty Three st- District Forty Three, and uh, and he's been stopping in and into different churches and talking to folks. And if you look at history, back when uh, it, when our country began, and and you look at the battles we fought and the different things. Now, the church was the one that kept the moral climate of our country. It went through the church. Uh, Because you're certainly not going to get any morality in the world. And if you you base it on Hollywood, you're definitely not going to get it. And uh, But thank you so much and look forward to getting to know you a little bit. And uh, Brother Steve met you and had some good things to say about you. So uh, get to know him. He also represents this area as well. And I know there's some good men running. And, uh, but we need to make sure that you do your part in the midterms, but also in the, in the primaries, and then also in November as well. Do your part. And, of course, <clears throat> we need a, in this state, we need a change at the top of leadership as well. That's a definite, and we need to be a part of that. Uh, with, but so glad to have you and your father with us, your son, and your wife and daughters at home. I'm glad to have you uh, here. But let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for goodness. We thank uh, for, for all that you have given to us this week. Wonderful week. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with those that are traveling, those that are away, some on vacation, some visiting ill family members. I pray you watch over them, be with them, give them uh, just traveling mercies, and, and give them a relaxing, wonderful time. And, Lord, for some that aren't here this morning because of illness, I pray you'll touch their body and to heal them. Pray for my father and uh, continued healing for my father and mother that you will touch their bodies and heal them. And, uh, Lord, for our country, our nation, our state, and, Lord, that we can have some uh, godly men and women that will uh, take office, that will lead this nation back in a direction that is honoring to you. But Lord, meet with us here this morning. We want all of those distractions away, and we just want to focus upon your word, upon your message, upon your music, and just praise and worship you here this morning. Lord, we love you. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Brother Randy. You can be seated. Turn to page number 147. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, page number 147. Thank 
back a few pages to number 143. Blessed Assurance, page number 143. Blessed Assurance. Aren't you glad that that's our story? That's our song. One of these days soon, I believe the rapture is going to take place. And uh, again, it's so good to have our visitors. And and uh, let me make an, another statement, and then I'll leave politics alone for a minute. And if you attend here very long, you know that we don't shy away from it. Do you know why the people that are in office today are in there? Because the church refused to vote. The Protestants refused to go to the polls and vote. And to me, I believe that it is our duty, it is our responsibility. And uh, I praise the Lord for Brother Steve, and uh, he keeps us informed and makes sure we have all the literature. And uh, you know what's sad is you can have a, a Democrat walk into a church and promote themselves and say anything they want, but as a pastor, uh, we can be, a lot of things can happen if I, uh, if I uh, focus on one. And uh, I will say this, I won't vote Democrat. I won't vote someone who is for abortion. Uh, to me, I just don't believe you're a true Christian. I, let me just say this, if you are for abortion, I think you need to ask yourself if you're truly saved. I believe that. And I, there's no way, and uh, I can say a lot more things, but I'll get myself in trouble. We've already been censored three times uh, with it, but make sure you get to know this gentleman and, and others as well. Uh, with that, be back tonight. Tonight, service at uh, 6 o'clock. Be here tonight, and it's important that you come tonight. 6 o'clock, it's always important. You say, why is that? Tonight will be the last six o'clock service that we have and on the 24th we'll be moving to an earlier service time next week is the uh, family fun night and at four o'clock and uh, be here for that I'll say a little bit about that but tonight service six o'clock and then of course we're going to move our service times morning service Sunday school will be the same 
The morning service like this will be the same. We're going to have a potluck, and then we're going to start the, e the afternoon service. We will have a message, songs, everything uh, will be just like we have been doing. You say, but we just ate. We're tired. I realize that, but you'll stay awake for a ball game. You'll stay awake for, uh, uh, for, for activities and different things. Uh, and I, you say, well, I need to take a nap. There's nothing stopped you at the 11 o'clock service. So what would stop you at that service? Get in your seat, get comfortable, and, uh, and rest. But we want to be a part, but we want to. There's several reasons for that. But be here tonight at 6 o'clock, Wednesday night service, 7 o'clock, regular service. We're going to keep the Wednesday night service. And so be here for that. And of course, tomorrow is the ladies' fellowship. I'll let my wife know if you're planning on attending so we make sure we have enough refreshments and also crafts. We're going to be doing crafts tomorrow, the ladies are. And so let my wife know that. And then next Sunday, regular services in the morning, and then it is family fun night. Now, uh, Jeremiah and uh, Jonah. They're going to be setting up a Hot Wheels racetrack, jump track, whatever it is. This is the only thing I know. They have challenged us adults to the race. So buy yourself a Hot Wheels car, truck, semi. Now, I'm not telling you. I would never give you bad advice. Men, kids, close your eyes. And for the next week, parents, don't let your children have any any uh, uh, any use of the internet, but men, look at any ways to make your car faster. We do not want to lose, okay? We do not want to. Not that I'm promoting cheating, just make your car faster. Um, with that, I'm not a Democrat, so I wouldn't promote cheating. So just, uh, I thought I was going to leave that alone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's your fault uh, with this. But we're going to have a great time, wonderful time. Then, of course, the 17th, two weeks from today, we have Resurrection Sunday, breakfast potluck. Uh, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. We'll have our sunrise breakfast. After that, we will have a morning service. We're going to uh, have the Lord's Supper, and uh, we'll take part of that, have a service. We'll have Sunday school, morning service. We'll have no afternoon, evening service. And so make sure you're here for that. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, 8 o'clock breakfast, 9 o'clock service. And then on Sunday, the 24th, we'll begin the new Sunday service times. We'll have a morning Sunday school morning service. We'll have a meal and then a potluck meal, and then we will have the service. But everything, I know there's going to be a few. We'll have to adapt some different things. Uh, but we want you to take part. We want you to be here. We want you to be uh, take part of this. Stay for the second service. Uh, most Sundays will be done. Uh, probably 2 o'clock, 2.15, uh, sometime 2.30 in that time, maybe 3, 3.30, 4. Can we hear a 5 here? Uh, we'll just spend the day here. You say, well, we ought to be a New Testament church. I'm shooting for 6 or 7 then uh, with that because they went all day. Uh, but we don't want to rush the service. We want to have a wonderful time. We're going to have preaching. And then also during that, throughout the year, some of the men are going to be preaching as well. And, uh, and so we want you to be. This doesn't mean that this is going to be this way the whole time. But with uh, fuel prices, inflation, everything going up, what can we do that best fits our church? Uh, we are an independent, fundamental Baptist church. We're independent. No one governs us. And so uh, we're responsible for this church. And so if you have any thoughts, please let me know. But we plan on starting that the 24th. Missionary Matt and Naomi uh, Shields will be with us on Wednesday, April 27th. Make plans to be here for that as well. Also, the Hughes did make it back to Moldova. And uh, they are taking care of several Ukrainian refugees that are coming through. have handed out several boxes of food. And so pray for the Hughes. And the missionaries there that are in Moldova, and of course we know what's taking place over there, and they wanted to get back and try to help them and, and tell them about Christ and try to reach as many people as they can there. Uh, church family, pray for Juan and Espy and Josephine, Nathan, Angela, and Nicholas. And then the Diedrichs to the Solomon Islands are missionaries of the week. You can leave your tithes and offerings there in the back, and please be faithful in your tithes and offerings. Brother Brandon, come and lead us in one more song. Let's stand once again, turn to page number 397, little as much when God is in it, page number 397.
aside from service, body worn from toil and care, you can still be in the battle, in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a Thank you. Good singing this morning. Thank you, Chatty, but Brandon, thank you for that. If you would turn your Bibles to John chapter 19, uh, John chapter 19. We've been looking at the seven sayings of Jesus Christ while on the cross. He spoke seven different times while up on the cross, and we will look at that, and then uh, we will culminate this whole series on uh, the Resurrection Sunday here in two weeks. And Uh, We will look at next week, it is finished, and what Jesus Christ meant by that. And then uh, when he talked about uh, my spirit, I commune to you, and and, uh, with that. But I want us to look at John chapter 19, two words, uh, in two verses, but we'll look at two words this morning. In verse 28, the Bible says, after this after the things that have already transpired upon the cross, after all that had been taken place from uh, the time he was scourged to the time that he was beaten, the time that he drug the cross, uh, the time that uh, he said, uh, uh, forgive them, and the time that uh, he said to uh, to the thief on the cross, the robber, the evildoer, as the Bible, the Greek would put it, Uh, He said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. He said, behold thy son, behold thy mother. And uh, the Bible says, after all of these had taken place, Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished. What things were accomplished? Everything that was required of him for our salvation, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop, a stalk, and put it to his mouth. But back in verse 28, the last two words, I thirst. Do you know this is the only time that Jesus Christ personally asked for something of himself? During this whole ordeal, this is the first time you say, no. He said, my God, my God, why? He said, no, 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 that was about God, not about him. I want us to look at this. This is the fifth saying of Christ while he's on the cross. And this one is a little bit hard to comprehend and, and not hard to look at, but, but to hard for us because we look at him as God. This is God himself. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what God's word teaches. As I've said many times, I'll say it again. I do not believe this Bible contains the word of God. I believe it is the word of God. I believe that everything in this Bible was there for an intended purpose. You say, why do you use the King James Version of the Bible? It is the pure text. It is the majority text. Everything that we use in this Bible was studied thoroughly for us. I believe God's Word. I don't pick and choose what I want. It's God's Word. And so when Jesus Christ said, I thirst, there's a reason why He said this. And I want us to look at this. You know, and you look at this passage of Scripture, let me just say by way of introduction, Jesus cried, I thirst, because he truly was thirsty. He was 100% God, but remember, he was 100% man as well. 
He was a God man. He never lost his, his divinity, his divine, uh, his Godhead when he became human. And uh, he never lost his humanity when he went back to heaven. He still bears all of the scars that he had while here upon the earth. Think about this for a moment. Jesus Christ said, I thirst, but he's the creator of the world. He's the creator of all water. The oceans, the rivers, the lakes, the, uh, the uh, uh, salt water and fresh water. When Jacob was here speaking, I said to him, and, and maybe some of you heard it, I said, that's fresh water. And he looked at me and he said, opposed to salt water? I'm like, man, you're just as much a smart aleck as you were when you were in class uh, some 20-some years ago uh, with it. And, uh, and, uh, but he made salt water. He made fresh water. He made springs. He made all the earth. And he said, I thirst here. Remember what the first miracle that Jesus Christ did? What was the first miracle? He turned water into wine. Not a poor, but a... A, a, a very powerful, remember the, the head of the, of the wedding said, usually the best is, re, is used first and then as you go through and, and is what he is saying is, is when uh, those that are consuming it become very happy, they can give them the less desired, they will drink it. And he says, but you've saved the last. Why? It wasn't that it was, I don't believe it was alcoholic. I believe that it was a juice that was not fermented because God cannot do wrong. But still, he made water into wine. Two different occasions, Jesus declared, if you drink the water that I give you, you'll never thirst. In John 4, 14, but whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He also said in John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now he is the supply of our living water, but he's also the supply of our spiritual water. When Jesus Christ said, I thirst, there was so much more to that statement other than just the humanity side of it saying, I thirst. There was so much more. Jesus never spoke without reason. He never uttered words just because everything that Jesus Christ said was with a purpose. I want us to consider this passage for a few moments here this morning, and I want us to look at a few things. The first is, is the sovereignty of Christ. The sovereignty of Christ. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now that word in the English language is two words, I thirst, but in the Greek it was actually one word. It was dipseo, and uh, coming from the word dipsoas. Now, in this, you look at his character. Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, everything that was put in place before God ever created was finished when it comes to salvation. Before God ever created, he already knew what it was going to take in order to secure our salvation. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ, looking at his Father, knowing that all things were accomplished, said, I thirst. Now the word accomplish means to bring to a close, to finish, complete, fulfill, to carry out the command given. Now this reveals his uh, divine omniscience. You know, he had endured hours of unspeakable torment. As we've talked about, the Mayo Clinic did a, uh, did a paper, and I need to make a copy and make it available, did a paper of what it took to, to, to really survive and what they would do during a crucifixion. How they'd put the nails in without breaking a bone. How they'd put a, a nail into the foot without breaking any bones. And, and they would put it in right next to the nerve system to cause extreme pain. 
The type of thorns were six to nine inches of thorns and, uh, and they would make it the reed. It says they beat it upon his head. They used a reed. Why? Because everything was in and it would go down your scalp. Now, if you hit your head right here, you think, man, it is really narrow. There's not much there, but actually you have quite a bit. Now, I'm not saying you have a quite a bit inside your, your head, but there is a good size layer to get to your skull. And those would run right down the sides of the skull. He was whipped, removed all of the skin from chest and from back, but not hit any extremities. He carried his cross partially and then had another carrying. We'll look at that. But you look at the torment that he went through. You know, I believe that we can't even, thinking about reading papers and studying it and, and the walk that he had to go through and, and the ridicule and the mockery and the blasphemy that, that went prior to him going to the cross and, and when they put the cross in, we can't even begin to understand what he went through. But yet he did it all for us. The end of it, he says, I thirst. You know, they had not grasped the plan of God to redeem fallen man. They did not understand and had no understanding of the absolute holiness of Christ and the sacrifice He made to reconcile us to Him. You see, only God the Father and Christ Himself understood what He had to go through. When you look at the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, you look at the commitment. Jesus knew that all things were now accomplished. Listen, he had not sidestepped his responsibilities. You say, well, when he was in the garden, he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't saying, Lord, God, if it's possible, don't, don't have me go to the cross. If it's possible, I don't want to go there. Is what he was saying is if there's any other way for salvation, let it be but I'm here to do my Father's will. When you think about what he went through and how he prayed, and he, the Bible says that he sweat great drops of blood. Why? Because of the agony he was going through before he was ever crucified. You see, he did it all for us. All of this talking about the sovereignty of Christ... After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He had not sought to avoid the cross. He fully submitted himself to the cross because even Peter tried to, uh, to thwart off the going to the cross and he cut off what Matthias' ear and, and he chopped it off and, and he said, listen, don't do that. He said, I can remove myself. I could cause it where I didn't have to go to the cross. He said, I could have called 10 legions of angels. I've said this before because it's true. Christ could have commanded the demons to do his work. But he said, there's a purpose for it. You see, you look at the sovereignty of Christ. In the Bible says that prior to him saying, I thirst, he knowing that all things were accomplished here, he fully submitted himself to the will of God to endure. Every detail of Calvary was being fulfilled. You know, I'm amazed at all that the Lord had to go through Everything he had to endure in the process of the crucifixion and he remained faithful. Everything that he went through, he felt every blow, he felt every pain. Well, he's God, he could numb himself. No, the Bible says that he felt everything. If you go back to the Old Testament, they say, you know, you see the, the movies and, and, and uh, uh, you see the movie that, that Mel Gibson put out several years ago and, there's, and he's got blood, a little bit of blood trickling down his face and a little bruise. And the Bible says that his visage ceased to look like a human but more like an animal. The Bible says they ripped his beard out of his face. The Bible says that uh, 
uh, they beat him, put a sack over his face and, and hit him and said, tell us who hit you. He could have removed himself, but he felt every single blow. Why? Because of you and me. That's why. He was fully God, but he was fully man. He could have called the angels to remove him. He didn't. He endured it all to the things, till all things were accomplished. Not part of it, not some of it, but everything had to be accomplished for our salvation. If Christ had left the cross early, we would not have our salvation. That's not a Baptist thing, that's a Bible thing. This is what God's Word teaches. I hear often this phrase, you Baptists. And for those that are visiting, I would rather be called a Biblicist. I believe in God's Word. I'm proud to be a Baptist. But the fact is, this is what God's Word teaches. I don't care what man teaches, what does God teach? Man better teach what's in God's Word. He had to hold to Calvary to ever hold to me. Had he left, we'd still be offering sacrifices, bringing it to the temple, offering it to God. But Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Jesus held to the cross. Why? Because he knew he had to finish what was put in place before he ever created. Now, Jesus was willing to endure all of that. Remained, he remained committed until the very last breath. But, you know, we have trouble remaining committed to Christ. Something comes into our life and we're like, oh, you know what? This, this church stuff isn't for me. This, this Bible stuff isn't for me. Seriously? Oh, we can trust Him for our salvation, but a little problem comes into our life and suddenly we no longer want to follow Christ. Folks, we need to stay committed to Christ. We need to stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? He stayed faithful for us. My salvation is based 100% on the fact that Jesus Christ did not leave the cross. Went to the grave and rose again. If anything had changed in that, we wouldn't have the salvation we have today. And listen, I'll guarantee you, I don't care how good you are, you can't be good enough to get to heaven. Why? It's all through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I too must. And, and, and I, I need to make sure that by the grace of God, I remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. I read this uh, this week in, in, in a, a meme that someone had placed. And someone said, I don't have to go to church to go to heaven. And they put, yes, and you don't have to go home to stay married. But it sure helps your relationship if you do. It helps our relationship with each other. It helps our relationship with God. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, the day of what? The return of Jesus Christ, the rapture. Part of going to this service, I really, really, really want to encourage you uh, to stay and, and stay for the potluck and, and stay for the service and, and have a time of fellowship in between and afterward. That's fine. We, we want to enjoy our family relationship. But there's so many people that say, I, I just don't need that. This happened to me at church. How many of you have ever had a bad doctor before? How many of you have ever wanted to choke a doctor? <laughs> How about recently? Oh, yeah. And if you've seen the x-rays of my father's arm, uh, a murder has, not, <laughs> has, has made a glance through there, but then I'm thinking, no, that wouldn't do me any good uh, with that. And my father was in a, in a cast for two weeks, and you look at the x-ray from when they first said it to uh, right before he had major surgery on and everything he's been through, I'm thinking... Can you trust, trust a doctor? We did because he did surgery. And we'll trust another doctor again. Just because you might have one bad one doesn't mean that you don't go to another one. I don't like dentists. I don't like going to the dentist's office. That to me is as close to purgatory as I will ever get. Why? I think when the, you know, sometimes when you open a door, there's a door buzzer that goes off and reminds them. 
not in a dentist's office. You open that door, you have that high-pitched drill or chisel or grinder or whatever. That thing starts screaming. And then they have, they have the audacity down here to Dr. Seaforly's office. I told them, I don't, you guys have all these degrees. You're all about as dumb as a box of rocks. You want to take my blood pressure and say it's a little high. Really? Man, I hear the people in the next room. I said, you put a chuck in my mouth and you talk to me the whole time. I mean, really? Can we not have a bit of silence during this time? But you know, I'm so dumb, I go back to them. <laughs> I mean, I can say what I want about them, but that's pretty dumb. Hey, I see you're back for your regular appointment. Yeah, I know, I just couldn't stay away. Why? Because my wife said I had bad breath. Go. Well, that's okay, you had bad breath when you left as well. So don't blame God or church because you had a bad experience. We need to stay faithful. I know this will surprise you. 20 years that we will celebrate being here at New Hope Baptist Church in June. Now, it's hard for me to admit because I don't know if it's fully true, but my wife says it is. I'm not perfect. <laughs> Boy, the ones that I never get anything out of laugh. Listen, I'm human. Make mistakes. Pastors make mistakes. Do I know of any recently? Of course not. Talk to my wife, she'll tell you a lot of them. Just come here very long and say, did you know you said that? You know, when you leave here, do something. Say, great message. Don't say, preacher, you know you said this. Really? Don't tell Wait, put it in a text or something. About 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night. Oh, hey, just by the way, you said this. Then I can think about it all sermon. The fact is humans make mistakes because we're human. He was fully God, yet he could have left the cross, but he did not leave the cross. Why? Because he knew that we needed a Savior because we're not God. You look at the Lord Jesus Christ, his control. Jesus was not a victim of the cross. Let me say this again. Jesus was not a victim of the cross. Well, you know, those Roman soldiers put him on the cross. They were fulfilling prophecy. The Jews accused him falsely. He shouldn't have went to the cross. He did not go to the cross because of mankind. He went to the cross because it was prophesied before God ever created. Jesus Christ was in complete control. Jesus was not a helpless victim. He was a willing Savior. By all outward appearances, it may seem like the Sanhedrin, the multitude, the Roman soldiers, the Jews, the Pharisees, those are the ones that put Christ to the cross. He was in complete control the whole time. He was never out of control. Why? He was 100% God. So when you look at the control of this, when he knew that all things were completed, he remained in absolute control even to the very end. Listen, this is not a situation that got out of hand. We've not read of a man that lost his influence and failed to achieve his goals. Jesus was there because he chose to be to finish the work of salvation. Aren't you glad of that? You see, that's his sovereignty. But you look at his submission in verse 28 as well. Even in the simplest words, we see the, the submission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider the responsibility of his thirst. Now all things were now accomplished that the scriptures might be fulfilled. What scriptures? In Psalm 69, 21, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. In John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. In Acts 2, 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. An angel could not do it because it's a created being. 
Man could not because we're sinful. And the Bible says in Hebrews that, uh, that, that Jesus Christ, His one sacrifice, paid for all of our sins of what thousands of bullocks and lambs could not do. Everything in the Old Testament looked to the cross. Everything today looks back at the cross. You see His submission. Now keep in mind, I want you to turn to John chapter 1 for just a moment. John chapter 1, turn your Bibles to John 1. In John 1, 1, keep in mind that the one hanging on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, is this verse, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Before God ever created, the Word was. We, we talked about going through Revelation. We, everything we do is based on time. How many of you set your alarm clocks this morning? How many of you set a two alarm clocks? How many of you set two? Any more than two? You can be honest here. We're in church. If you're lying and you hold... You know, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, sin in my heart, God won't hear me. So if you didn't raise your hand, you know that either you're telling the truth or you're lying, and I'll let God deal with you <laughs> when you leave here. We ain't got time for messing with you during church. So don't let God strike you in church. Everything we know is based on time. But before Genesis 1-1, it was eternity, no time. At the end of the millennial thousand year, we will cease to have time and we'll have eternity again. Everything that Jesus did was based upon the Word of God. We have the Word of God. You see, Jesus Christ here, when Jesus Christ went to the cross... He knew, here's what's interesting, God knew, Jesus Christ knew everything that was hap going to happen before John ever penned it. Everything that took place on the cross, he already knew before John penned it, uh, before it was penned in the Psalms, before it was penned in Isaiah, before anything was written, God already knew, the Lord Jesus Christ already knew what was going to happen. You, can you imagine knowing everything prior to it yet going through and fulfilling it. Why did he go to the cross? He fulfilled scripture. He completed and entirely fulfilled the scriptures in every aspect. Do you realize there was not a single word that was prophesied about the Lord Jesus Christ that did not come true? From his uh, being conceived in a virgin to be born in, in Jerusalem, to be born in a manger, not in a motel, to him going to the cross, everything had been prophesied. Even to this, I thirst. He was fulfilling prophecy. Why? He's in complete, complete control of everything. He's God. You see, when he talked about his submission, the responsibility here, there's not a single word prophesied concerning him. The reality of his thirst. Now, much can be said in regard to the thirst of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. But the main focus was to fulfill the scriptures in, in essence, the will of God. But we cannot overlook the physical aspect of this thirst. Jesus, who is holy God, but we must not forget he was holy man as well. He lived in a body just like you and I. This morning I was, we were getting dressed and I was working on my tie and my collar and I walked into the, into the restroom, the bathroom, and I hit my elbow on the door frame. What bone did I hit? It ain't nothing funny about it, I'm telling you. It's only funny from those that are watching. And my wife looked at me and she goes, ooh. I'm not going to say anything because it looked like it hurt. 
I said, sweetie, it didn't look like it hurt. It really did hurt. Why? I'm human. Nick, we were talking about it. It's amazing. The older you get, you know, you, you young people, man, dad, I don't know why you're so stiff. I don't know why you're walking. Why are you sore when you wake up? I, I'm glad I'll never get like that. Yes, you will. God, Terry, his coming. Your dad's going to look at you and say, man, you are looking old. Well, thank you. I mean, it, my brother loves it. He says, this is my older brother. And he's three years older than me. I have been asked more. In, I'm going to start wearing a hat again. I've been asked more in the last three weeks if I get the senior discount than I ever have. Joey, he's laughing because we went golfing one time. That's been a while ago. He's a senior, and they gave me the senior discount. We walked, I said, how much did you pay? And I told him, he goes, I think they gave you the senior discount. I ain't complaining. You know, if that's what you want to do, that's fine with me. Uh, you know, some of y'all, you, you, you're old, not, and you don't look it. Not talking about you, Joe. I don't know what that person, they're blind or something. He's what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. You always have to have one in the crowd. You know, the only time he says something is, is, is a negative. You know, we're in church. Be positive all the time. It's like my son showed me a picture. You know, the, the different instruments that you use to find water. Uh, golf ball is one of them. And uh, <laughs> yes, they float. No, they go all the way to the bottom. But you know, we hurt. You go to bed feeling good and you wake up stiff. Jesus felt everything. Every bit of pain he felt. Jesus felt the same emotions and experiences, the same feelings that we do. He knew what it was to experience pain, to feel loneliness, to feel anger. He had already endured hours upon the cross. He had received no water. Think about it for a moment. He has been beaten. He has been whipped, which means he has lost a lot of blood and fluids which means dehydration is starting to set into his body. He's thirsty. Now, he was offered drink earlier in the crucifixion, and he denied it because it had, it had a narcotic in it. And he said no. He wanted nothing to deaden the pain. He's fully God. He could not allow sin to enter into him. But now everything's complete. His body had been bleeding, losing fluids. We cannot begin to comprehend the physical and emotional suffering that Christ endured. Oh, you think he, he suffered emotionally? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As all of sin was placed upon him. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He knew what it was like. You see the sympathy of, the, uh, of Christ. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now he endured a physical thirst, but in this humble cry from our Lord, we see his sympathy for all of those who thirst spiritually as well. I'm not reading into Scripture. I believe that he had an intended uh, interpretation, an intended purpose of not just saying, I thirst physically, but also the world thirsts spiritually. He endured all of this. Consider the message here. Jesus had endured all of the sin placed upon him. Six hours on the cross, three hours in, the world turns black. A type of blackness, darkness that you could not see, the fingers in front of your face. It was total darkness for three hours. 
You could hear Christ. I imagine you could hear the moans. You could hear the groans. You could hear the anguish that was on his body. And he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As all of sin was placed upon his body, he suffered the judgment of God and he thirsted. There's a powerful truth here. Let me say this. Sin can never satisfy. All of the sin was placed upon Christ and he said, I thirst. Sin cannot satisfy anything in a person's life. It never quenches the thirst of a, of a parched soul. Mankind, you can indulge in every sin imaginable and it will never fill that longing within your soul. It will never provide the satisfaction that we need. Young people, it always it bothers me. I, I, I can't, other than Satan is so powerful. Don't give him an inch. Man, you can take your family and you can teach them everything about the Word of God. They see the trash out there. They see the wickedness. They see what the world does to them. And they're living a good godly life. And the second they leave home, they run straight to that. I'm thinking why. The only thing the devil can give you is hell itself. That's it. He can't give you joy, he can't give you peace, he can't give you satisfaction, he can't give you a wonderful time. You know, I've had a wonderful life. I was born, reared in church, I, I, was, I was brought to church a few days after I was born and, and, and I've never missed church. I've always been a part of church. You've missed out, I haven't missed out on anything. I've enjoyed my life. You say, well, there are some things that you would like to have done. I've enjoyed my life. You know, you've missed out on this and this. I wouldn't know. I've enjoyed my life. I still get to do the things I love. I love fishing. And uh, not that I always catch fish. No comments either. But I do like to feed fish. <laughs> you know, if it's metal, if it's worms, it doesn't matter. They get it or trees get it, uh, logs get it. I mean, you just, if it's there, I'm going to catch it other than fish. Love to hunt. Hunt trees. I know. I know what's going through your mind. I can, I can kill a tree really good. I can hit an object this big around, but I can't hit a big deer. It's like, really? It, it, takes, it takes really. I just wanted to scare them. That's all. Really didn't want to mess with it. Skill, yes. I, I'm, you know, some of y'all use vehicles to get your deer. I just let them walk on. Yeah, you know, they won't walk in an open place, but they'll walk out in front of a car. I still enjoy time with our family, time with our church family. I'm looking forward to beating Jeremiah next week. Um, what are you going to do if you don't? I'm going to cry. Get along with the Lord for a few minutes. Ask for forgiveness. If I have a chance to mess with your car before that, I won't. I'll have someone else. Just saying. <laughs> I'm not a Democrat. Uh, I'll blame someone else. I'll have, a, I'll, have a, I'll have a Republican do it. That way it could be, you know, I got to get off this. It's still your fault. <laughs> gotta, see, that's what Democrats do. They just, uh, are you, <laughs> okay, I better stick with the word. The sympathy. The Bible says in Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You see, the message was that sin never satisfied. Everything had been accomplished to this point. Everything. Everything needed for our salvation had been accomplished. And he said, I thirst. He will say, it's finished here. Next week we'll look at it, it's finished. But everything had been accomplished. Sin never satisfies. You see the misery here. 
We cannot imagine the suffering that Jesus endured. We cannot imagine what he went through upon the cross. Think about the physical suffering that Christ went through. But that did not compare to the spiritual separation from God. You see, everything he endured did not compare to the loss of fellowship with his father. Up to this point, he had never been outside the fellowship of his father. You say, wait a minute, he was inside of his mother for nine months. But while he was breathing and before this, he had never been outside of fellowship with his father. And now he is. The physical thir thirst that Jesus endured couldn't compare to this fellowship. This was the first time. Now Jesus proclaimed a great truth in this statement. Separation from God will always result in misery. Always. You see someone who's not walking with God, who used to walk with God, listen, they're not happy. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You can say you have no right to judge. God's Word does give me a right to judge. If a person is enjoying the sin and wickedness they're involved in and they used to call themselves a Christian, the Bible says in the book of Romans that person is not saved. Why? Because the conviction of the Holy Spirit is so grave in their life. David said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Prior to that, he says, my bones vex sore. It wasn't because he was beaten up. It wasn't because he was hit. It was because of the sin that he was involved in in his life. If the Holy Spirit indwells us, if the Holy Spirit lives within us, there's no way that we can enjoy the wickedness of the world and get away with it. You see, when there's a separation from God, there's always misery. That's why it's important to keep a close relationship with God. It's important to walk closely with God. Let me say this. I can always trace a person's time in God's Word. When someone gets away from God, someone's involved in some heinous activity, you can always trace it back to their time with God. You spend quality time with God. And listen, you're going to see it all over them. I'm not saying you're not going to go through a trial. I'm not saying you're not going to go through a hard time. But it will force you to spend more time with God. You know, you, you look at COVID. COVID came out and, and they're saying, take the vaccine, take the vaccine. I want to make you uh, take the vaccine and the masks and everything else. And, and you had some doctors come out that said, listen, you need to take vitamin D. You need to take iodine. You need to take vitamin C. You need to take a magnesium. You need to take zinc. You need to take all of these things that your body is going to need to fight it. And we say, oh, no, 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 no. It's all I need is this shot. The fact is, is we needed all of that stuff. We didn't need the shot. Well, listen, you're a good person. I, I know you're mad at God. I know you're away from God. I know you're, you're involved in this activity. But God understands. I despise that statement because it's so anti-Bible. God doesn't understand that. God looks at it as being wicked away from Him. God understands righteousness. God understands godliness. God understands holiness. And when we're involved in activities that are contrary to God's word, it brings misery in our life. That's why it's important to be around God's people. Listen, even as the pastor of this church, you say, man, it must be wonderful to be the pastor. Everybody loves you. Everybody talks kindly about you. Everybody thinks you're the greatest. Well, I'd be number two. My wife would be number one. And uh, everybody is just wonderful. And you have no spiritual battles. Do you know there's times that I don't feel like being in church? If I can be honest with you. There's times that I don't feel like coming up on a Sunday morning and being here at church. Rarely, let me say this. 
There's times that I'll sit inside the bed, my wife and I, and there's a battle that we're going through. And we'll just sit there and weep. And when we walk into church, it's a wonderful feeling being around family. I have never left church not saying, I've never left church saying I wished I hadn't come. I always say, man, I'm so glad I was in church. You say, well, it's your job. You're the pastor. Listen, all of us have battles. All of us have times. What's the most important thing? Be in church. Be faithful. I was surprised to see Brother Potter. Well, I wasn't really surprised. I, I, uh, I, I probably shouldn't tell him what I told the nurse there. He was going off on the nurse. He was not a happy camper in, in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, hospital. I said, Brother Dale, man, you are just an ornery old man, a sweet. He said, Preacher, you don't know the half of it. I hide it from you and the angels. I said, I'm pretty sure the angels know that part of you. That angel, was so, that, that angel, she wasn't an angel. She was a nurse. She was so worked up that I didn't miss. Potter, you didn't tell me I had to put all my garb on. I didn't read the door either. And that's a whole other story. But in, in uh, 30 years of visiting the hospital, it's the first time I've ever been kicked out um, of a room. But I did pray with him. Uh, not to get away from this, the misery of being separated from God. Why did you come to church this morning? Because you had to come to church? No, we had a desire to be in church. Oh, we've missed, y'all. You've been gone for... I was going to hand visitors cards out, but I uh, didn't. You know, they've been gone uh, and, and been sick and been ill. We have missed you, but I know from the text messages, y'all have missed being here too. Grace, you've missed seeing me. My smiling face. <laughs> she didn't, she's like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> you were a senile old man is what she was thinking there for a minute. The gray hair gave it away. Mankind may enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but it always results in death and separation from God. The last thing here very quickly is this, the scrutiny of the crowd. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. As Christ died upon the cross, a multitude looked on him, but they failed to see the significance of the cross. They failed to realize that this was God dying for our sins upon the cross. They failed to. Notice their blindness. You know, as the multitude looked on that day, they, they failed to recognize the fullness of Jesus Christ's suffering. They saw an ordinary man going to a cross that had done some good things, but had been lied about by the Sanhedrin, even by Pilate, and uh, he was hanging on a cross, obviously for things that he had done wrong. So they looked at an ordinary man instead of seeing God himself. They saw a man that was being punished and he said, I thirst. They never realized that the spiritual thirst was far greater than the physical thirst. Many considered the cross and, and their minds are consumed only with the physical aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you talk about the cross or you look at a cross, you see the, the pain that was brought about, but it was much more than that. You see, I'm not making light of what Jesus Christ endured, but Christ endured much physically, but He endured much more spiritually. You see, he suffered the separation from God. Listen to this. So that we never have to. For three hours, as God placed all of sin upon the Lord Jesus Christ, he was separated with fellowship from his Father. I never have to lose fellowship with God. If God tarry his coming and I die on this earth a natural death, I'll still never have separation from God because my last breath will be my first breath in heaven. Their weakness, 
You know, I would think that some that day probably did care and maybe some compassion struck them. Is there anything I can do to, to make this pain go away? Is there anything I can do to, uh, to bring a little bit of help to you? But they were limited in what they could do to Christ. Oh, they gave him a sponge with some, with some vinegar in it. Uh, they tried to uh, cause it and maybe quench his thirst for a moment. A dry, uh, dry cracked lips, maybe a cotton mouth and, and maybe dry. They tried to comfort him just a little bit. I'm sure they were moved in some way to help, but they were limited in what they could do for this Lord and Savior. But you know, the same is true regarding humanity. Our lives enjoy so many comforts, so many things that former generations didn't enjoy. I didn't grow up in the horse and buggy era, although we had horses. My grandfather did. He would talk about his team of horses and we'd go up to Bightley every year, the steam engine show, and they would have the steam engines and, and the old tractors that my grandfather had, the old John Deere's, and my father and I was talking about the tractors we used to have back in the 70s and, and uh, uh, the different ones and how you would start them. Remember the team of horses you would see up to Bightley and, and uh, say, man, wouldn't it be wonderful to go back to those days? Not really. A day where you go out, I like getting in, in our vehicle and, and uh, you can hit a button and pre-start it so it warms up. And the new one, you can hit a button and the seat warms up. It's comfortable when it's really hot. You can hit AC and you think you're going to die if you don't have it. Or the heat's not working properly, or you go into a house with all of the modern conveniences. Uh, think about going to the store back in the old days, and, and you, you have to hitch a team of horses, and you take the team of horses uh, close to town, and it's cold. Man, we can run to Grand Rapids if we want to. We can run over to Detroit. You can run down to, uh, to, to, the blue, to, to, down to uh, Constantine and... And ship Shawana and eat if you want to. You, you can really travel anywhere in just a couple hours. We have so many conveniences. Our cell phone, that's a curse. They really are. But if you leave it at home, you feel like you're naked. You, you feel like you forgot a major part. They have contraptions that in some of the places that we hunt in Missouri, there's no cell service and so it just drains your battery and there's a little cord you can plug into a, a, an external, uh, uh, external charger and you plug that in and you can put it, that external charger in a scent eliminator if you're in the tree. There's so many conveniences we have. But we're in the same boat that those people were at the cross. There's nothing we can do to satisfy our longing. Only Christ can. That thirst that we have for salvation, only Christ can satisfy that. When he said, I thirst, he wasn't just talking about his physical. He was talking about the spiritual as well. Man has much to offer that benefits others. But he cannot, not, cannot offer the one thing that he needs most. A saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again in verse 28 it says, After this Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Again, this knowledge... Have you ever acknowledged your need of salvation? I don't care if you're a first-time visitor, if you're someone that's been here uh, multiple times, or if you call this your church home. Do you realize that the only thing that will satisfy that thirst is the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, we're excited for the Resurrection Sunday. Some call it Easter. I, I call it Resurrection Sunday. Listen, this, this holiday, I, this is my favorite why? Because my sins were paid for because of Jesus Christ. I realized that on June the 8th, 1994, my true need of salvation. I've never questioned my salvation since. 
If you've never fully trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, not a knowledge in God, a relationship with God, not a religion, a relationship, today's the day. You do not know if you have another day. Again, it ain't a Baptist thing, although we preach it. This is what God's Word teaches. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ went to the cross for our salvation. If you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, today's the day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you will be with us here this morning. Lord, if someone here this morning has never received you as their personal Savior, I pray. Lord, I plead that you allow the Holy Spirit to so convict them that they will not, cannot leave without knowing for sure that they're saved. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Nobody's looking around. Is there anyone like that this morning? Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I won't embarrass you, won't call you down. Uh, I will not come to your seat. But is there anyone like that today? Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I do not know for sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you raise your hand and allow me to pray for you? I won't embarrass you. But would you let me pray for you that the Lord would convict your heart that you wouldn't leave here. If you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, be faithful to God. Thank God. Worship God. Because He's the one that offered it for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll be with us here in these next few moments. Lord, again, if someone did not raise their hand or those that did, I pray that you will so convict their heart that they will come forward and, and allow a man to show a man and a lady to show a lady how they can know for sure that if they die today, they could go to heaven. They would simply show, show them your word that tells them here's what you have to do to know for sure you're saved. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.